Hello, this is Political Forum for Wednesday, September 21st. Uh, today we welcome Illinois State Senator Patricia Van Pelt of the 5th District uh, as our guest. And well, Senator Van Pelt, thank you for being on Political Forum. Happy to be here today. Okay. Uh, well, my name is Levi Moore. I'm a board member here at Can TV, and you're watching a live interactive program brought to you as a community service by Can TV. So be sure to tell your friends that they can also watch this show online at cantv.org backslash hotline. And we welcome your questions and comments for Senator Van Pelt by calling us at 312-738-1060. Once again, 312-738-1060. So during the next 25 minutes, we'll try to get to as many of your calls as possible on the air. Here's the contact information for Senator Van Pelt. If you weren't able to get that information, we're going to leave it up there for a while, but if you uh, aren't able to get that information yet, uh, we'll show it again throughout the show. Well, uh, Senator Van Pelt, uh, what's new? I, I, I met you way back in 2012 when you first started in the General Assembly. Uh, it was like your first or second week. Yes. Uh, and now we've kind of come full circle. So. Oh, it feels <laughs> like five or ten years. Uh, well, <laughs> well, you just you won uh, re-election. You, you won your primary. You're, yes. and you're, uh, you have no opponent in the general, so uh, right. congratulations. Thank you. And, uh, well, you know, um, what, what, what's on your mind? Well, you know, I've been in the Senate now for five years. I mean, four years. Mm -hmm. Finished my four-year term mm -hmm. up. Um, going right into the fifth year now, so I'm excited about that. It, and if, if things have been so different, so many changes. It, what we, what it, we started with, a Democratic governor, a Democratic House, a Democratic Senate. A lot of different things were, you know, we were able to do easily. Now it's like, you know, constipated. <laughs> Almost, you know, things move so slowly. But, um, and now we have a new governor, a Republican governor, so it's, it's a new game now. It's, 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 everything is different. And the things that used to be simple for us to get for our constituents are no longer as simple as they were. Well, you know, let, let's touch on a couple of things before the call start. Um, there's the budget, which we can say is, well, challenged or not attractive to this stopgap budget. What are some of your thoughts on that? Well, I'm just happy we have a stopgap budget. Um, I'm glad we have some kind of budget because so many people suffered, uh, have been suffering under this stalemate that we've been in. And really, it, the reality of, of it, the issue is that if we were to succumb to the governor and give him everything he wanted, it wouldn't even change the, our financial uh, problems, wouldn't even be solved just if we gave him everything he wanted. So it really, if we gave him everything he wants, a lot of people would suffer in the state. And our job is to represent the people. So I'm here to represent people. And we've had meetings with the governor, and, and he said, you know, he really wants us to work together. But in the end, we have to come home to the people that we represent. And I want to be sure that whatever I do, that I'm standing up for the people that I'm there to represent. Yeah, but in your position, on, you're on a number of committees, you're on appropriations committee, you're on the... Uh, you're the vice chair of the public health committee, right. uh, the economic development committee too. But mm -hmm. um, what there are a couple areas of I know we, we talked earlier that you know, are really close. That they really hit you close. Education and criminal justice. Right, right. I'm on the criminal. I'm on the criminal law uh, committee as well. Um, education is so important because our children need a better, uh, opp more opportunities, have better uh, funding for. We need better funding for the schools and better opportunities for the kids. Um, we also know that with the criminal justice system as it is, a lot of our children are uh, impacted negatively by either because them themselves are being impacted by the criminal justice system or uh, their parents. So it's a big challenge. It's really a, a cycle that we have to break and understand that in order to break that, we need to make some changes in some of the laws. And, and this requires just coordination beyond just uh, Springfield, too, uh, that you, you're working with people at the county? Yes, uh, President Preckwinkle, very hard worker on these issues. In fact, Mayor Rahm Emanuel has been a friend on these issues. So uh, they, I think if people are coming to understand the need to really uh, do something about the criminal justice issues that we're facing in our community. Because it's called the Department of Corrections, but we don't see many corrections happening. Hmm. So we really uh -huh. need to, it's more like destruction. Once a person comes in contact with the criminal justice system in Illinois, their life basically as they knew it is over. And that's, it really shouldn't be that way. We should be able to uh, have restoration. Okay. 
Oh, just one little reminder. Oh, we have a caller. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, and good evening, and uh, I hope everything is doing well with all, everyone, also that's listening. I got a quick question, and I know sometimes we ask questions or you ask things, so try to just give me the best answer that you could possibly can give me. What do you really think about our governor, and what do you think about Mr. Madigan? Is it to a point where one don't want to listen and one don't care? Uh, I know that's kind of hard to answer that, um, but it seems like there's a big problem. And uh, our governor, it seems like he has his own way in his Virginia. He don't want to give in and, and things of that nature. So, and, I, and listen, and I don't want to put you on the ropes. So, I mean... What what do you think your honest opinion about those two people that I was asking? And uh, if it's unfair, please don't answer the question. I think you're doing a heck of a good job. Uh, I, I really do. I think we need more women in politics because men sometimes are the most craziest creatures on God green earth. Sometimes women can settle things more quicker. But listen, I don't want to ramble because I know there's other callers on. I want to thank you for taking the call. Let me get out the phone and hear your response. And by the way, it's not unfair what I'm asking, is it? No, it's not unfair. Okay. You asked let, me, let me get out there so I can hear response. And again, thank you for taking the call. <laughs> well. Um, there you go. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, my district runs from, um, from downtown on Clark Street all the way over west to Cicero. And it goes as far north as Webster and as far south as 26th Street. So I have a very, very diverse district. Um, so the question that, that the caller asked about my opinion on those two gentlemen, you know, I try to reserve my opinion to hear, I like to hear the opinion of the people that I'm supposed to represent. Because as a senator, I have a certain amount of, of power being a senator, and I want to be sure that I'm carrying the voices of ordinary people into government. That's the reason why I ran. And I, and I mean that. I'm not just saying that as a you know, political statement. Uh, but what I've been told across the district, from all the way up north, where the Pritzkers live up in my district, and Higginbottoms, and lots of rich people on the other end, and then very poor people on, on, the, uh, on, on the south, further, further south end of the district, uh, over and over again, I hear people saying that they do not want to see us cut uh, senior programs. They do not want to see us cut uh, programs for kids for after school. They do not want to see us cut funding for our schools. They want support for those schools. They want the, the seniors to have their supportive services that they, they have, uh, they've had in the past, and they want to see the youth have an opportunity to develop and grow. So to me, those are the most important things that I would focus in on. And so as I work with, uh, in, in the Senate, I've been in there now four years, going into the fifth year, uh, starting in January, um, we've been able to pass a budget to cover those issues every single year. There's not been a year that we have not had a budget until we got the new governor. So I, I look at it this way. If, if, things, were, um, if things are being held up, um, it may be because we have different philosophies on, on the way people ought to live or what we should do as a, as a government. But in reality, uh, we have to eventually draw it down to who's responsible for um, for the situation, and when you really look at it, the governor runs the state. He is the chief executive officer of the state, and if he's the chief executive officer of the state, it is his job to get all the people in the room and get the job done. Um, Madigan has been sitting there for years, and we've had a budget every single year. So that should say something right there. Every year we've had a budget. We have never failed to have a budget. Now we we don't have a budget, and we haven't had one going on to two years. And the only thing that's different is that we got a new governor. So I think that people want to see these, these programs funded and these seniors supported and the youth. Uh, and also uh, I think they want to see us grow as a state fight, even business-wise as well. So um, I think that we should just focus in on 
what we're trying to achieve. And then, you know, not I don't want to get into who's right or who's wrong, but I will say again that we've had a budget every single year, even though Madigan has been the House Speaker for many years. Okay, looks like we have another caller. Hello? Good evening, State Senator. Uh, you talk about education. Why won't we have, when we talk about school choice, why won't we have the voucher system? Because the reason I ask that, when you talk about primary school, it costs more money to send a child to a public school than a private school. And when you look and see some of the, especially the charter school, they're being taken over by the state, and we've got the corruption and misappropriation of funds. And when you look at Chicago public teachers, according to the um, Sun Times, there was Lloyd Washington World Road article two years ago when you got 40% of Chicago public school teachers send their own children to private school. Mm -hmm. Why don't the parents of other children have a choice as well? Um, thank you so much for that question. What do you think about that? Um, <laughs> I know you're not the legislator. No. <laughs> well, you know, the, the voucher issue is just one of those once it, it kind of neighbors are split on it mm -hmm. um and i'm from chicago but i'm a native downstater and uh they're they're split down there it it, it really depends on philosophical the philosophical issues and mm -hmm. then just your ability to you know how are you taxed um do you feel you're uh, contributing an equitable amount on your taxes for education mm -hmm. Well, you know, and you hit right on the head the answer that I would have given as well, and that is that the neighbors are split on it. The residents are split on that idea, um, and it's not 50-50 either. Most parents, most people that I talk to do not want vouchers. So, you know, my job as a state senator is not to go down and exercise my will. I'm a preacher, and you all, some of you all know that. I'm a preacher, but I do not go down there to become, I was not elected to become your minister. You know, I was elected to represent you on state law, and that's what I, I work hard to do, and I try to keep myself out of it. So the majority of the constituents are not, are not on board with the voucher system. And if they were, um, you know, just like charter schools, we have plenty of charter schools, in our, especially in the 5th District, and it's because the people want them. So that's what it, it boils down to. Okay, well, look, Housie, uh, earlier uh, Senator Van Pelt referenced her uh, district, so there's a little map of what the Illinois uh, Senate 5th, 5th District map looks like. And uh, there you can go to her uh, website. Uh, I'm sure there's information on her biography, district information, employment opportunities. And then I even found out that you, at various points, you worked in a steel mill, uh, you, were P you, you have a PhD, mm -hmm. you uh, are a minister, and now you're a state senator. Yes, <laughs> I worked in a steel mill for about eight years as a um, drill press operator. I was in a union. I was a union steward, as a matter of fact. Um, I enjoyed that work, but the steel mills closed down and all this, the companies moved out of the country. So I had to go back to school and uh, try to get a different, start thinking about my future differently. Uh, and I did go back and get a, an associate's degree in natural science and a bachelor's degree in human services administration and a master's degree in public administration and a doctorate degree in human services administration and with a focus in on social movements, what makes movements work. And I did that because I was concerned about what was happening in our community and I felt like we really needed something big to happen and I didn't, like a movement and I didn't know what made them work and what made them fail so that's what I studied. Okay. We have another caller. Hello? Hi, good evening. Senator uh, Van Pelt. Good evening. Uh, yeah, my question is, you know, it pertains to the public school system as to why there was a public school system established, uh, why it's now kind of dwindling away when there could be other resources uh, made available. Like up here, they about the new uh, House Bill 106 to tax uh, financial transactions as an option to save uh, public schools and make, you know, just general funds available to to the state. Uh, there, there was back in the day the, the uh, I guess, uh, what is it, um, lottery that was supposed to have been taking care of the public schools and things like uh, if, you know, they just pay back and put things away from, you know, the, 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 the saving of the schools. And that's, that's pretty much my, my question. Uh, 
opinion. Just wondering, how can they actually be saved, and can any of these other resources ever become available to save the public schools? Well, this, that's a very good question. Thank you so much for that question. Um, first of all, the public schools have been funded and, and, been, and been said that it was going to be funded using the lottery dollars as well, besides general aid dollars. But what has happened is that when the uh, lottery dollars were uh, added to the pot, then other money was subtracted from the pot. So I want to see a time when we have a strict amount that goes to the schools no matter what. That's what I want to see because I believe our public schools can be fantastic. I mean, in this district, we have public schools, regular traditional public schools where the kids are doing phenomenal. And we also have charter schools, tradition, uh, public charter schools that are um, also doing phenomenal. And then we have some charter schools that are doing absolutely terrible and we have some traditional schools that are doing absolutely terrible. So what does that tell me is that it must have something to do with the leadership in the school. And a lot of times they need more resources is needed depending on what type of, you know, what kind of students you, you're working with. And we know we have a lot of challenges, mental health challenges and a lot of uh, behavior problems and also uh, just academic challenges in our schools with our students, many of our students. And sometimes they need more money. So I am definitely on board for, for that formula. We've been working on that formula for a while creating a formula to fund all schools so that we don't have some schools in, on the, in the uh, very, um, you know, prosperous suburbs uh, spending 18000 to 21000 per student, and while we in other areas like, poor areas like um, some of these poor, poor areas of the city spending $1,500 per student per year. So I really think it's important that we create a formula so that the, all the kids are getting adequate funding for adequate education. Uh, thank you. We have another caller. Welcome to Let me switch gears um, and talk about the um, uh, elections. With the elections heating up, that we're seeing a lot of uh, ads that are on the television. Um, and so I'm wondering, uh, Senator, uh, what's your take on uh, capping of uh, political uh, advertisements and, and the likes? I know that I believe it's Governor Rauner was said to be giving like close to $16 million for the for the for the GOP party, so I, I want to catch a uh, catch your take on that. Thank you so much for that question, as well. Um, I I haven't studied the issue, but let me tell you, it costs a lot of money to run for office. The first time I ran for office, it cost me over three hundred thousand dollars personal dollars, and uh, I ran because I just was sick and tired of living the way I was living, and I and I felt that we could have some change that you know maybe I could have some kind of impact because I live in Chicago and I was tired of living in the, in the state that I was living in, 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 the, in the situation that I'm, I was living in, circumstances. So, and when I ran the second time, it cost three hundred over $300,000 too. I think that's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, every time we make, send one mailer out, it's $14,000 for each mailer that I mail out. And that's only to 20,000 people. That's not to the whole district. The district has 200,000 people in it. So if I mail out to 20,000 people, it costs me about $14,000. So it's just really, really expensive. And I, and, I, and I would, you know, just off the cuff, I would say, yes, we need caps because it's ridiculous the amount of money it costs. An ordinary citizen uh, is not in any position to be able to even run because they just don't have that kind of money to, to put out there and, and risk. You know, so I think, it's, I, th I think that you're onto something. And I really... I really would like to see something like that explored uh, more deeply for cap, for us to have caps on the political contributions and also on the spending. Okay. You're watching Political Forum, a uh, community service of CAN TV. I'm Levi Moore, CAN TV board member. And this is a live interactive show. And you can call in at 312 738 1060 if you have a question for our guest, State Senator Patricia Van Pelt. And just in case you give you another chance to see her contact information, it's right there. And um, we'll also give you, show you what, show her your her uh, website. Okay, um, you touched on. There's a lot of talk that there's a potential for a grand bargain uh, at the leading into the, this veto session. A big part of it would be uh, finally solving the education funding inequities in the state. Do you, do you, do you think that, are, are you going to Springfield 
hopeful of that or you be just being kind of wary and just see how things go or no I'm, I'm always hopeful I have to be hopeful because I don't want to sink down to thinking nothing can happen when I know that one one person can make a decision uh, and we can have change take place um, I don't know what's going to happen in Springfield I'm hopeful that the governor will come uh, to the table with some real legislation uh, if he's not going to support what we've been creating we've been working on on the formula for uh, over a year. Uh, so and we've had lots of voices in on that formula, lots of people in, that have contributed all over the state. So we really have a good, solid program that people are willing to support. Um, but, but the governor has to get on board, and all the Republicans basically only vote, um, except for a couple of them, mostly every one of them except for about one or two, vote with the governor every single time, no matter what the issue is. So I'm hopeful, I'm very hopeful, that we have a grand barrier. Oh, we have a caller. Hello, welcome to Political Forum. Hi, Senator. Um, Hi. With talks right now of CPS going on strike, what's your thoughts on elected school board? I think that um, that's something that we're really looking at. It seems like more and more people are in support of it. Uh, I've always, when I ran for mayor, I was in support of a hybrid system where it was partially elected and partially um, appointed because I felt as mayor I would want to have some role in deciding what was happening in the schools. I'm, I'm not mayor, uh, and I'm, a, I'm now a state senator, as you know, and my job now is to represent the interests and ideas of the people in my district. So I'm watching this issue very closely to see where people uh, stand on the issue. Uh, right now it looks like there's a strong possibility that the elected school board is something that people are calling for and would like to see happen. My concern about that is that mo if it's an elected school board and there's no caps on the contributions or spending, then we're really just going to have the rich deciding who runs the schools, which is exactly you know how it is now, basically. The governor, the governor or the mayor or the people in power make the decision about who's, who's running our schools in, in Chicago. Um, and there, if there's an election and it's not caps or any type of criteria that keeps people from being able to um, just take over, we could end up with a bigger mess than we have now. Because you have to remember, we used to have um, a school board that was not all appointed by the mayor. That we had that situation before, and we changed it because the schools were doing poorly. So we, uh, you know, sometimes you need to look back at history, but you know, also we need to look at what's happening now. We're we're a lot more connected than we were in the past. We actually have uh, social media, which allows us to be more connected than we were in the past. So maybe this is the time for it. But I'm in support of what my constituents support. And I mean that. As I said earlier, um, I, I'm not down there to represent myself. I'm, I'm doing a service uh, to, for our state, and that is to represent the ideas and the visions of the people who live in the 5th District. And it's a very complex district, very rich and very poor, you know, in the same district. But my job is to weave the common threads and try to promote what the majority of our uh, people want. The only way I won't do that if it has something to do with injustice. If I feel like the majority is supporting something that's unjust, I am not going to support that. Because I believe I have, that is my primary responsibility. Thank you. Okay, we have another caller that might be, with the, with the time is over, might be our last caller for this evening, but uh, welcome to Political Forum. Huh? Thank you. Um, good evening, Senator. Um, I want to thank you, firstly, for being on the show. Um, and I actually want to get your take on the, the upcoming presidential election. Um, mm -hmm. As you know, the, the polls it indicate that Hillary Clinton has all but lost her lead uh, over Donald Trump, and many people have attributed that to the fact that she is a woman in politics and there is some implicit bias um, against women politicians. And I wanted to firstly get your opinion or learn about your experience, and do you find that there is discrimination against women politicians and women politicians are taken less seriously? And I'd also like to know um, why, uh, if it's not um, the fact that she's a woman, that the race has tightened so quickly and that now she is pretty much tied with Donald Trump for this contest. Well, I don't spend a whole lot of time looking at the polls right now because I, I remember when President Obama ran, it was as if he was losing every week. They were saying, he, this is so tight, it's, he's, you know, he can lose any minute and all this. And he was basically had his path to, to 
he had his path already laid out, and he he kept saying the path is laid out for me to get the nomination, you know, and they kept bringing up that he was it was the race was so tight that he might lose it. So I I have confidence in especially the women in in uh, this country because we tend to you know majority of us tend to try to figure out how do we mend things, not how we tear things apart. So I have confidence that with a strong turnout from the women that we will have our first female president. And I believe Hillary Clinton is the best choice, not just because she's Democratic, but because uh, of, when you compare it to two candidates, I would not want to, I would not rest well if uh, Trump became my president, because I, I don't know what he might do. And so I, I have seen some discrimination against women uh, politicians, but it really lies in the hands of the constituents. And the constituents have been strongly in support of women in, in, the, in the state of Illinois. And I'm believing that we hopefully can have that happen across this nation, too, as well. Okay, uh, Senator Van Pelt, we have just a few minutes left in tonight's show. Um, are there any final comments you'd like to make? Well, I, I'd just like to say that um, we have, we've been talking about a lot of you know, challenges, but some of the good news that we have is that I believe that the governor does want to have you know, education funding uh, corrected. We want to have it in the Senate, and I believe the House wants it. So we have a good chance, I really believe, of coming down to an agreement on that, uh, on the education funding, which would be large because we have never funded education adequately. So this will be our first time. Uh, secondly, um, we have strong support across the board for criminal justice reform. One of the bills that I passed in the last session, um, had, they had been trying to pass it for 13 years, they couldn't pass it, and that was to guarantee that minors under 15 would have, um, uh, have representation uh, if they're being interrogated by the police, that they would be represented by an attorney. Because right now, they don't have to be represented by an attorney. So a lot of the youth end up confessing the things they haven't, they, they haven't done. In fact, we are now known as the false confession capital of the nation because we have so many young people that have confessed the crimes and signed all kinds of agreements when they did not commit the crime. And I think that that is largely because they have not had representation in that room for interrogation. So uh, the governor did sign the bill, and we have good support for that. Um, and so up to 15 years old, and any youth now that's being interrogated period, no matter how old they are, even up to 17, will also have to have uh, videotaping going on so we can at least get inside of that room. So I'm excited about that. Okay. Well, once again, this is Senator Van Pelt's contact information. And, uh, well, Senator Van Pelt, thank you for appearing on Political Forum, and thank you, viewers, for calling in tonight. Our telephone technician has been Sylvia. Political Forum is brought to you as a community service by Can TV. Please join us every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. on Can TV 21, and you can also uh, view on CanTV.org forward slash hotline. And good night.